we had some hiccups. Yeah. OK, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and to anyone who's watching online. Um, so my name is Stephen Wares. I'm the cyber risk practice leader for the EMEA region for Marsh. Uh, for those of you who don't know Marsh and know that name, Marsh are part of the Marsh and McLennan group of companies. Marsh are the largest insurance broker in the world and risk advisor. And so I think I'm probably the only insurance speaker uh, on the roster today. Um, perhaps that's one too many. Um, but uh, uh, I'm going to be looking at this topic through an insurance lens. And insurance is becoming more important, and they're having more of a, insurers are having more of a say in the area of cyber risk. Obviously, some of the outcomes of cyber attack are insured by the insurance industry. And so you can expect the insurance market to have an increasing say on what happens around uh, uh, cyber security and, and managing cyber risk. So the topic of my talk is navigating cyber exposure because one of the biggest challenges is just defining what cyber risk is and what the impacts might be for the organization. So the first question that I want to pose is what is the extent of the investigation that has typically been applied to cyber impact assessment? Um, and Marsh have just completed a European-wide survey. We surveyed uh, hundreds of companies across all industries, across 17 different European countries, and we gathered up the responses to attitudes to cyber risk and how they're being managed. And so I'll just use some of that survey data to answer these questions. And perhaps the first point to start with is, does it appear on the corporate risk register? And where does it appear on the corporate re risk register? Is cyber risk being given a priority against some of the other competing risks within the business? So um, what, what you can see here is um, that for um, uh, uh, over half of the companies, the risk is either not featuring in the top 10 or it's not on the risk register at all, which seems particularly surprising when you compare that against the priority given to cyber risk by national governments, for example. If you look at uh, uh, strategic security risks for national governments, it's always placed in the top tier. It's number one or number two. It's in the top tier of, uh, of risk considered by national governments. But for organizations across Europe, this was the response that was coming back, that for um, uh, around half of the organizations, it's not in the top 10 or it's not even featured on the risk register. Now, clearly, if a risk is not even getting onto the risk register or it's not in the top 10, then the level of investigation around that risk is going to be reasonably limited. So we, we asked further, to what extent do you believe your organization has a clear understanding of the exposure of cyber risk? And you can see here that 21% of organizations said they have a complete understanding, which means that 79% of organizations, at best, had a basic understanding of cyber risk. Now, the, the question was asked in that way, so we can speculate what basic understanding might mean. I think in view of the earlier question and where it appears on the risk register, basic probably means very basic understanding of the cyber risk profile. So it's not appearing on the risk register regularly. It is, appears to be under-investigated, and organizations have a limited understanding of the, of the exposures that they face. We did ask, well, do you, have you identified one cyber scenario that might materially impact the organization. And even when we asked that question, only slightly more than half, 57%, said yes, we have identified one scenario that would materially impact the organization, which again lends evidence to the fact that this is an under-investigated area of exposure. Um, so we asked as well, have you undertaken a financial assessment of, um, of the um, impact of a cyber attack. And um, you can see that 68% of companies said no, they had not undertaken any sort of financial assessment of the impact. And so um, uh, I think we, what are we at, 68%, yeah, 68% saying no, no financial estimates. So we have a situation where potentially organizations are unaware of the nature of the threat, the outcome of the threat, and the cost of the, of the threat. So who's responsible? Um, whose obligation is it? it? Where is cyber risk being placed? So we asked that question. Who takes primary responsibility for IT risk within your organization? Now, you can see the range of answers we got from different countries here. But overall, 65% said IT. It's, it's IT's responsibility. And overall, you can see 11% said the board and 11% identified risk management function 
as uh, having res primary responsibility for cyber risk. So what conclusion could we draw from, from that compared to some of the earlier statistics? Does that mean the IT function are failing to, um, uh, to identify um, uh, what the impact of cyber risk is, elevate it to the risk register, et cetera, et cetera? Is this a failure of the IT function? Well, no, uh, I don't think it is. I think that in terms of responsibility for IT risk, there is a balance between the IT function and the other functions in the group. So the IT function, the natural, the natural domain of the IT function is prevention. Uh, that is what uh, IT security professionals are paid to do, prevent an incident from happening. So there is a balance to be made between the likelihood of an incident happening and the impact of the incident occurring. And the IT function is actually very well equipped to report on probability. So uh, you would be able to say the degree of sophistication of uh, an organization's IT controls in comparison with a maturity standard or other, peer other peers within your industry. Perhaps you're able to estimate what the likelihood of an event is to happen. But actually, in terms of impact, if that event does happen, and what is the reputational, operational, and financial impact for the organization, that is not the natural domain of the IT function. IT are paid to prevent uh, those incidents from happening, not necessarily to consider what the organizational impact of that event is uh, if it does occur. And so ultimately, that has to be the domain of the executive board. So we've seen some of these events are potentially catastrophic. They can ruin reputations. And we've seen some uh, chief executives and other board members having to resign from organizations following a security event. And so if there is any doubt as to where responsibility lies for impact, uh, that should be a clear indicator. So ultimately, the executive board and the risk and audit committee are going to take primary responsibility for the impact of a cyber event, but they are going to need input from various operational uh, departments within the organization, including compliance, legal, operations, human resources, commercial unit heads, and brand management to help identify what those individual impacts might be and what the scenarios are that they consider would be most impactful for the organization. So there is a balance between probability and impact, and whilst probability is probably reasonably sophisticated, impact is the underexplored area, and that is primarily because as I mentioned earlier, the board and risk management do not appear to be as involved um, in this area of risk as perhaps they should be. So, how might an organization begin to assess cyber-based exposure? Um, well, um, uh, I've been meeting some organizations whilst I'm here in Latvia, and I met one organization this morning, and I was asked the question, well, if you're going to run this type of project, how do you define cyber risk? And that is an excellent question and the very first place to start. And um, in terms of definition of cyber risk, we did publish a paper that we, we, we collaborated on with 13 different insurers and uh, around a similar number of government departments from the UK government. We published a paper in March and we pu published this taxonomy to give organizations um, a, a reference point for defining what cyber risk might, might be and how to start thinking about cyber risk. So as you can see on the left-hand side here, we have uh, your adversary, um, their, their level of uh, sophistication, how persistent they're going to be, whether they're internal to your organization or external, what their motivation is, so what's their point of attack, what are they after? And then finally, the types of damage that might flow from that attack. So using that type of framework, we can start to define what the scenarios might be that impact the business. Who is it that's likely to attack us? Uh, how close are they to our, to our network? How persistent are they? What are they after? What does that mean in terms of loss outcomes? So at its very, very simplest level, perhaps you come up with this. So this, again, is taken from that same report. We asked the insurers to do this. And we asked all of those 13 insurers, well, you, you plot um, uh, those impacts on, on this access uh, for a typical large organization. Now, clearly, that's a very difficult task because that will differ from industry to industry. So really, this is just an example of how um, a very simple uh, risk assessment might look. And clearly, you can see some of the uh, impacts, IP, theft, privacy event, plotted on that axis of probability and severity. Now, perhaps you can achieve that in an afternoon. 
just by gathering together a few of the key stakeholders within the organization and brainstorming that type of exercise and plotting uh, where you think your core risks are on that axis. And that just gives you a little reference point to take things further and, uh, and, and, and would only really be a start point. But if you wanted to um, run a more investigatory project, um, then the start point would be to define cyber risk, but also define how you're going to apply that to your business. So Marsh run these projects for organizations. There's a lot of these going on internally within organizations right now. Uh, other consultancies are running this project as well. Um, the start point is to define whether you are going to tackle the entire group at once. Many, of the, of many organizations have lots of different activities, lots of functions, business units. Are you going to tackle the entire group at once? Or are, are you maybe going to pilot this within one division and then roll it out to other subsidiary companies? How are you going to define cyber risk? What are you going to go and look for when you start the project? So um, perhaps you're going to restrict this to malicious activity, to hacking uh, events, essentially breaches of security, or maybe you're going to include uh, business continuity type events, so IT system failures uh, within your definition of cyber as well, um, and define your, your cyber risk uh, environment that way. And then some sort of mapping of the underlying IT that supports that business so that we understand what it is that drives value within the organization that, um, that we're going to study. And then in terms of gathering the exposure, there are different, there are different methods of doing that. You could do it in a one-day workshop, again, gathering stakeholders together, depending on the size of your organization, and through a one-day workshop, start to brainstorm some of those areas, gather up those scenarios, document those scenarios, and produce the report at the end of the day. Um, now, ideally, you would do structured interviews. So you would take an individual from the legal department, from brand management, from operations, and interview them one-to-one -to, -one to try to gather their opinion without being influenced by other stakeholders. Um, you'd be gathering the scenarios that that individual thinks are most material to their function and to the organization, and then bring that back to a workshop environment or a stakeholder group for evaluation of the long list uh, so that you can start to filter that down into something more meaningful. Now, for very large organizations, uh, it may be that your stakeholders are, are too, too many, and you need to do that through some sort of questionnaire, so sending out a questionnaire and receiving those responses back it may be that through a core stakeholder group, you've already identified what are the core things that you think are material, and you want your other stakeholders to identify which of those things are applicable to their area of the business, so selecting from a drop-down menu. So there are different ways of gathering the data that you might need in order to build a risk profile. But once you've gathered that data, you're going to have to start to put together the common items. You will have gathered very similar scenarios from different perspectives, from different people in the organization. Amalgamate those scenarios, write them up as something that uh, makes sense and could also be taken into the next phase, which would be quantification. So how are you going to assess the financial impact um, of that scenario coming true? And then remove the immaterial items. So what might be material to one individual in one part of the business is not ne necessarily material at, at a group level. And so filter out the immaterial items and keep only those that are, that are really impactful for the organization. So what might that scenario look like? It might look like something like this. So we've identified who our actor is. So we're concerned by a criminal organization. Uh, their motivation is the acquisition of payment card data. They are remote to our organization. They are not an internal threat. The point of attack is going to be the point of sale devices and the damage that flows from that. Well, you can see the list of damage there. So we can start to build up a single scenario as to what might be a material uh, threat to the organization. And that is something that, as you can see, you can take on to um, uh, use enough for other purposes, either to direct risk, risk mitigation efforts, to direct insurance purchase, which is where uh, as, uh, the insurance industry and Marsh come in, but the identification of the damage items and, and starting to quantify what those items are allows the organization to assess the impact of that type of event and decide whether uh, a transfer of that risk to the insurance market might be something that they would want to do. So in terms of identifying, putting a number on it, so how likely is it to happen and uh, what is the cost to the organization? So 
it is very unlikely that you will be able to pinpoint precisely how likely an event is to happen. And exactly the same, it is very unlikely that you will be able to get to the last euro, dollar, whatever it might be, exactly what the cost of that event is going to be. But you can probably put a range on it, and it's, it might be an educated guess, but it might be pretty true as well. So the IT function, as mentioned earlier, are the right place to ask how likely is the event to happen. And so perhaps we can put a, a range on that. Perhaps that's a 1 in 10 event. Perhaps it's a 1 in 2 event. Perhaps it's a 1 in 250 event. But the IT function should be able to provide some sort of estimate as to how likely they think that, that event is to occur based on um, the maturity of the security that applies to, uh, to that particular scenario. And then how the impact of the event is more a question for the other stakeholders in the room. So perhaps uh, the business unit owner, legal, other, other um, individuals associated with the, the precise impact of the loss. And again, we might be able to put a range on what that loss might look like. Again, not necessarily not necessary to put it down to the exact dollar, euro, pound, but perhaps we start to gain an understanding of, of which risks are material and which risks are catastrophic and which ones are, are not particularly material. For those exposures with um, very good data, we are able to start to model that. So Marsh have a model, and we call that Marsh Cyber Ideal, and this models the cost of data breach for US organizations. I say US because they have mandatory breach notice law over there, so data breaches are, are, are publicized, are known, uh, whereas that is not the case in Europe. But that does give us the data that we need to be able to run a, run a model, and we can start to predict what a 1 in 2 event might look like, what a 1 in 10 event might look like, and what a 1 in 20 event might look like. Um, this is just one slide from that model. Uh, we are also able to break down those those total costs into individual cost items um, that might relate to that event. So where there is good data, we don't have to just guess, put the thumb in the air and think it's between this and this. We might be able to uh, reference some actual claim data um, uh, to give us an even better idea. So how does the insurance industry play a role? Um, so I mentioned that the insurance industry is going to have a bigger stake in this going forward, um, and I'll just explain why that might be a bit later on. But um, first of all, I mentioned that Marsh do that type of project. This is on one slide our framework for delivering that type of project. Um, at either end, we have an IT security assessment and the placement of insurance. In the middle is the bulk of our um, activity, and we break that into three areas. One is providing that profile, that unique uh, list of cyber scenarios for that organization and using that as a, as a specification to go into the insurance market and purchase insurance against. The second phase is insurability analysis. Which, one, which ones of these scenarios, which ones of these loss outcomes is insurable? Which ones can the insurance market take on? Which ones are covered by your existing insurance and which ones are not? Which ones could you buy more insurance for? And then the final phase is the modeling phase so that we can understand how to optimize the insurance program. Uh, what level of insurance should you be buying? Now, if we think about um, some of the impacts from cyber attack and just use a hospital administration system as an example. So an IT company providing outsourced software administ uh, hospital administration systems on a hosted basis. Now, if there was a security breach affecting those hospital administration systems, what could be the impact of that? Now, if that was loss of availability or um, uh, uh, changes in the, in the data itself, so loss of integrity of the data, you could see that some of these outcomes might be possible. The death or injury of patients, the cancellation of procedures as a result of disruption to the hospital, uh, contamination of other hospital systems if uh, the malicious code is transferred to other uh, hospital systems, liability for um, breach of privacy if medical records are affected, perhaps the reputation of the hospital is severely damaged by publicity around the event, leading to loss of revenue, um, and finally regulatory sanctions from either a healthcare regulator or a data protection regulator, perhaps there are some regulatory sanctions there as well. So you can see that from a single uh, event affecting uh, a single system, we might end up with lots of different, <coughs> excuse me, lots of different loss outcomes. 
Now, that could be challenging to track through to the insurance program that an organization buys. And if we think about the insurance market, on the right-hand side here, we've got some traditional insurance categories, not all of them. It would be a very long list, but here are some of the traditional insurances that might be bought. So damage to property, crime insurance, so theft of, bank, of, of money from bank accounts, uh, civil liability, so, so injury to your employees or to other third parties, product recall, liability of directors for management failures. Those are some of the traditional insurances bought. Now, you can probably start to tell that some of those loss outcomes might be directed to some of those categories. Um, on the left-hand side here, we have an, uh, uh, the new boy on the block. So this is cyber insurance. Been around for about 20 years, actually, but it's only really now getting some traction in Europe. Um, uh, a lot of cyber insurance sold in America, only really now getting traction in Europe. And cyber insurance does some specific things that the traditional insurance market haven't traditionally done. So they deal with data breach incidents specifically, um, liability and incident response costs connected to those data breach incidents. It deals with network outage and the loss of revenue connected to network outage. It deals with the, the damage or the corruption of data and the restoration of that data, uh, extortion events and even the content of your uh, website uh, being defamatory or perhaps infringing someone's intellectual property. So there's a range of things that cyber insurance does. There's a range of things that traditional insurance does. And perhaps you can start to see that depending on the scenario and the individual lo loss items that we, that we run off that scenario, it may be a multiple range of different insurances that actually have to respond to that event. So the mapping of those scenarios against the protection that the company enjoys from its insurance program is quite a big task and shouldn't be underestimated. And it's going to get even more important. Um, and as we connect more and more devices, more and more of those insurances are going to be brought into play. Things that, that were not affected by cyber events in the past are suddenly going to be triggered by cyber events. So we've seen 2.4 million cars withdrawn recently or recalled recently as a result of a vulnerability found in, digital, uh, in the digital radio system. Well, again, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, who would have thought that cyber attack would be a product recall issue for motor vehicles? Um, uh, the German government reporting uh, massive damage to a steel mill as a result of an attack on industrial systems at the end of last year. Well, now we have a, a physical property damage event. Not just Hacking isn't just about stealing data or confidentiality issues anymore. It's about actually, actually it can actually create physical events, which clearly has an impact on the property insurance market. So for the insurance market, they're going to have to start to think about every single line of business, every single insurance policy they write. Could that be affected by a cyber attack? And for the buyers of that insurance, they are also going to have to think is that, is that insurance that I've just bought, whether it's a property insurance, a motor insurance, or whatever it might be, is that also going to respond if that outcome is created by a security incident? Um, so do companies understand what insurance they've got? Um, there are different surveys going on around this. The top one is a survey done by the British government, and they asked executive level, uh, do, you, do you have insurance protection against security events? And this year, 39% said yes. Last year, 52% said yes. So it's going in the right direction. But the insurance industry also ask, do these surveys and say, well, does the organization buy cyber insurance? And you can see 15 to 20% said yes, they buy cyber insurance. And down, down the bottom, we have this 2% figure. We looked at the premium flows into the insurance market against cyber insurance and then estimated what the what the penetration rate was. And we estimated, actually, it's probably nearer 2% uh, penetration in the UK anyway, and that's probably not too far from, different from for any European company country, um, uh, actually have dedicated cyber insurance. So I guess the message I'm taking from this slide is that there may be a disconnect between the protection that executive levels think they have from insurance and the level of protection that they actually do have. And clearly, that's a gap that needs to be closed. Um, so back to the survey data um, that I referenced at the beginning of this talk. Um, we asked this year, do you buy cyber insurance? 12% said yes. 55% have no intention of buying cyber insurance. Now, we might speculate that that means it's irrelevant. 
Um, I don't think that's the case, actually. I think that references back to the lack of understanding of what the risk actually is and how to quantify the risk. Because if we can't identify it in our organization and we can't put a number on it, then we're in a poor position to transfer it to the insurance market. So who's buying? So this is from our own purchasing data. Uh, you can see the big spike is uh, communications, media, and technology industry. Uh, so no great surprise there. The most technologically enabled are perhaps those that are, are most aware of the risk and buying insurance against it. Financial institutions and retail are the next big purchasers of dedicated cyber insurance. Um, again, probably referencing the very high volumes of personal data and sensitive data that financial institutions store and payment card data that retailers uh, hold. And the experience in America where we have a very mature market uh, this shows the increase in take-up over the last two years and, who, who, and where that increase is coming from. You can see that the big purchases over the last couple of years have been healthcare, power and utilities and retail, again, perhaps driven by the sensitive nature of the information that they're holding. Oops, went off that a bit too quick. Right, am I out of time? Has it, has it decided I'm out of time? I think it has. Um, okay, so the, the final slide, just some reading material. Um, so I, I hope I've given you something of interest in this session, but if, if you are interested in reading more about how insurance plays a role in this and attitudes to cyber risk across Europe, uh, this publication came out this month. This is our European survey, 17 countries, uh, and this, the role of insurance in managing and mitigating the risk, both of these can be found on the Marsh website and, and probably a general Google search. They pop up, pop up all over the place, so some further reading if you're, if you're interested. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. OK, do we have any questions? Uh, if, if anybody is here from the company that has actually insured something from the IT. OK, uh, do, do you want to tell us uh, a couple of experience? Uh, was, it, was, it, was it long? Did, did, it, did it do something better for the company and all because you had to go through all of that process and, 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 and so? Have you ever uh, needed uh, the, the insurance coverage in this case? Oh, that's even better. So, so how the companies rely to that, that such service is, 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 is possible or they are already knowing about it and they are seeking it? Okay, startups never occur to me as, as, as one of the key audiences, but yeah, you're right here. So it's at least screen professional and assessed professionally. So it's not just the number the CEO of the startup thinks it is. I understand that, yeah, yeah. So, uh, are you from London as well? Oh, okay, so that market is, let us say, more aware of this and, 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 and being a, one of the financial capitals and so, so, so maybe it's, it's more common. Now, uh, I think about Baltic states and I, of course, think about some, some companies that really deliver such, such services and, and yes, we, we sometimes go and the service is not available and there's some breaches and there's electricity losses and everything. I never heard that they uh, were 
ensuring that or, or reimbursing that. Well, or, I, I think that's true, and the 2% penetration rate figure uh, demonstrates yeah. that, and for the vast majority of organizations, they are not taking out this insurance at the moment. So there may be some awareness that the insurance exists, and certainly the insurance industry are trying to do as much as they can to promote the fact that this insurance is available for organizations. But the challenge is, once you, once you realize the insurance is available, how do you then compare that against the risk that you're running in the organization and make a value judgment as to whether the premium that is charged for that insurance is worthwhile. So that, that is the gap that we have to bridge for a lot of organizations. Am I, as a CEO of the company, uh, in a position to assess that myself with my resources or that requires some individual independent auditors or something? Because you would, of course, uh, you cannot say the number, the premium, of such thing until you have some, some, some valid paper or something signed by whatever the big companies that it's like that. Well, the, the, insurance, uh, the insurers themselves can value the risk and they value the, the risk through the insurance premium. Yeah. So they don't necessarily need the company to do that for them. But the, the challenge is for the company to decide whether the premium represents fair value and good value against the risk they're running. And that's going to be a combination of the probability and the impact that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, and, and, and probably it could help the company itself to discover something and to cover something and, you know, issue some new policies and assess some risks they maybe neglected a little bit before. Well, certainly the insurers are trying to deliver risk assessment services uh, along with those products and increasingly there are connected uh, 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 assistance uh, that you can purchase from the insurers, perhaps at discounted rates from their preferred vendors, yeah. but more on the, on the incident response itself. When you get a security breach, the insurers are also plugged into various different vendors from law firms to IT forensic companies who can be deployed very quickly and expertly to deal with that incident where those resources may not exist previously. Right. Okay. Uh, let us thank Stephen. Thank you. Uh, one, one, one second, I will, I, will, I will give you also a, 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 a small gift from the organizers as a uh, little thank you uh, for being here and uh, informing the attendants. Please. Okay. Thank you.